this motherfucker's putting jokes in his poem. Disgusting! <laughs> we only do Shakespeare here, you dick. Hello and welcome to the Protest Podcast, the podcast where I can talk about whatever I want to because it's my podcast and not yours. I mean, I don't know if I can legally do that. That is someone else's catchphrase. But what I can legally do is bring you some really cool guests. And therefore, we have a wonderful guest with us today. Do I use government name? Do I use stage name? What do we want for today? We're cl- I, I say both, uh, <laughs> just so the streets know who I am. Uh, so was it Jamal... Kid and Nancy Hassan. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, yeah a little inverted commas. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> Hella, how are you on this fine yeah. day? I, I was going to date what day it is, but no one cares. This yeah. is a weird podcast thing. I'm honestly really good. It's like one of those nice sunny days where it's like, oh, damn, I forgot to take my sunglasses with me. And I like those kinds of days. Nice. Cool. Well, we are going to be doing this fun podcasty thing. Um, but before we get into my fun segments and all of that, what I always like to do is challenge both myself and my guests for how did we first meet? Okay, so I I'm actually quite good at this with good friends I have. So I remember the first time we met was Spoken Word London. You did the Too Many Vegan Poets Poets poem. Um and yeah, that was when I, f- I remember that was when we first met and I was like, you're really cool. I want to like, I want to be like you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it was just then seeing you at future events after that. And then I started coming to uh, Boomerang like recently after like meeting you. Yeah, because I remember you in the wonderful way had your Ainsley Harriet cushion pillow <laughs> thing. And it's like, okay, this one's different. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I I do love that pillow so much because I ha- cause the weirdest part is I didn't even buy it for myself. It was my friends who knew my love for a- oops, who knew my love for Ainsley and basically my friend Chloe b- got me the pillow like out of nowhere. And I'm like, I I never knew I needed anything so bad. Oh my god, you've you've leveled me up so bad. Um, you, have, you have awakened something in me that I didn't know was there. Something primal and biblical. You- I mean, if I was one to do social media content a lot more, this would be clipped out, and then there'd be a GIF or from community. I have the weirdest boner right now, <laughs> but I'm not one for that level of content. <laughs> But what I am in the content for is we're going to do segments. So we're okay. going to do this in a wonderfully Charles Dickens way. Oh, this is where I'm, I realize I'm bad with my fucking writers, but we're going to do a Charles Dickens mm-hmm. way. We're going to do some past, present, future shit. Okay. So I'm going to cut to a nice graphic here. Okay. And then we're going to get into our section called Timelines. All righty. <laughs> So, for our section called Timelines, as Tywin repeatedly knocks his own damn um, podcast... T- I forgot what the word of this fucking thing is. Boom arm. There we go. That yeah. will work. Timelines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is professional. We're doing it professionally. Yeah, exactly. Um, I like to go over people's past, presents, and futures. In I like to frame it as their creative endeavours. All right. As much as, obviously, this is primarily a poetry podcast, I know so many people on here have, like so many creative things they're doing, whether it's also music and acting yeah. and other stuff. And I like this space to be open for all of the creative things. So Fair Jamal, enough. where did you get into your creative side? I've always been creative, definitely. But um, I actually, my main start was in music. So just uh, throughout my teens, uh, I played a lot of guitar and a bit of piano and I really, like, as a kid, I really wanted to actually, like, build and fix, like, musical instruments um, for a living. Um, But then I basically didn't have the confidence to keep pursuing that because I was like, oh, no, everyone's listening to dubstep and everyone's using, like, electronic stuff. And I don't want to learn electrical engineering because it's long. So I was like... So yeah, I spent most of my like late teens into uni just aimlessly bounding around being like, what the fuck am I going to do with my life? But I had always written poetry here and there. And it was always like funny little poems because I remember like there was this really funny poem 
I can't even remember who wrote it, but it was called Milking. And it was basically, um, it was like a punchline poem where like most of the poem was like basically talking about like your first time having sex. But then the last line is, I was actually milking a cow. And it's hilarious. And I remember reading that at 15 and being like, I'll occasionally like write little things for myself. I wrote like a little thing um, about like a jealous boyfriend who turned out to be jealous of like 50 shades of gray. And that was when I was like 17. And from like 17 to like throughout uni, I would occasionally write a little poem here and there every few months, share it with friends. But I had like no confidence to like go to an open mic because I was genuinely terrified that I go to one and they'd be like, this motherfucker's putting jokes in his poem. Disgusting. <laughs> we only do Shakespeare here, you <laughs> dick. And that was... um. That was basically like what prevented me. But then after like my second year at uni during the summer, because I was going to go abroad for a year, my friends had been like basically going like, no, go to an open mic night, go to an open mic night. So I went to Poetry Unplugged and I shared some of my poems and people liked them. And I was like, okay, people like funny poetry. Maybe I should do this some more. Um, I feel like especially in London, Poetry Unplugged and Spoken Word London pre-pandemic at least, are responsible for a lot of people getting into this bullshit. That's where you dip your... Yeah, it was those two. Those two were the, the toe dippers, like the main ones. And like there was also a jaw dance, which I tried getting onto, but um, I just attended because I never like got on. I was never lucky enough to get on the open mic. Um, and yeah, I was, I was pretty much like, yeah, after like doing Poetry Unplugged for a few weeks, I go abroad um, and I come back and I'm still like, I'm way too scared to like go to another po um, open mic night. So I'm only going to Poetry Unplugged. Then I go to Spoken Word London one time and I'm like, oh, this is, this is, this is it. This is the good shit. This is, oh yeah. And yeah. Pretty much from there, I didn't look back. Also, because I was studying languages, like, literally, I had come back from my year abroad and Brexit happened. So, like, all of my ideas of what I was going to do for a living just were, like, pfft. So, at that point, I was like, fuck it. Maybe I should be a writer because I like the idea of writing. I love writing. So, maybe I'll do that. I want to imagine as a similar as an alternate universe where similar to Tim Timothy Chalamet, you were doing a YouTube channel where Timothy Chalamet mods modded like old school gaming controllers, <laughs> your modern old old school like instruments and whatnot <laughs> and shit. Because that feels like a a pathway of like what could have been, etc. Yeah. I do think a lot about like what could have been because I know that especially given the school I went to, it would have been very difficult to it would have probably been harder to convince my mom of pursuing music than languages because i was at least good enough at languages that my teacher was like my teacher said no 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 like let him do languages he'll actually get into a good uni for it my mom was like no my son will only be a doctor or disowned um and like beyond that like actually getting into music i would have had to like pretty much do it all on my own and Sometimes I think maybe that would have been good for me because like I, there were a lot of like independence things that I wanted to learn at a younger age, like getting a part-time job, managing my own finances, stuff like that. But my mom was very much like, don't do that. Just focus on your education, which was good. But also it meant that I only started to learn that shit by like 25. Was there ever a time with your whole writing stuff, obviously coming from the music that music and poetry overlapped at the start or was they always like very separate things of music and that side was this part and now poetry and language is a very different part i'm doing very separately from music so i really would always try to put them together because i've always wanted to be a songwriter but i always in my brain had the music and the poetry or at least the music and the writing be fully different so i always struggled to write a piece and have music for it that I liked. But I also think it was just because like, I never really trusted the process um, because like I'm doing that now where I'm actually learning to write songs, produce an album and actually make stuff. But 
yeah, when I was, because I remember like when I started going to Penting, I was like, okay, finally, I'm going to like teach myself to rap and I'm going to be able to freestyle. And I just, it was always very much like I could only get like semi competent. And even there, like I com competent is like a stretch. Um, I could only like do like very, I could only like barely hold a bar together after like regular practice. But then if I don't practice for a week, I lose it all. So yeah, there were a lot of attempts to bring music and the poetry together. It's just that for some reason, my brain will always separate them. Fair. And I, well, I think as we come into our present side of all this, it seems that like you, to call it simply, have made quite a name for yourself on the scene, both as the performer, but also as the host and organizer, among many other things. So like, where would you say your creative self is nowadays what is your present what are you working on doing at the moment so i think one of the big things i'm gonna try and say this in the most politically correct way <laughs> okay one of the big take backs that i had from lockdown and the pandemic was that a lot of people thought that the poetry community was closer than it actually was <laughs> and that people were more on the same page than they actually were. Mm -hmm. And because I still love and appreciate everyone in the community, because like not only are they my friends, they're also my colleagues, and we're all essentially working towards a, we're a greater all in goal. We're together, as we, they say in High School Musical. Exactly. Um, yeah, with that, um, I focus more on just being a, setting a good example for the community, um, and because I already had, like, I was working a lot with Hannah Gordon, um, with Spoken Word London, with hosting, um, because like when I started hosting, it was, it allowed me to do a lot of the things I wanted to do with an open mic, but easier where it's like, okay, I don't necessarily like, whilst I want to perform, I want to perform more just to get the wigglies out of the piece um, more than I need people to be like reviewing and sharing and like all that stuff. So I liked the idea of like, I'm a host. I'm just going to do one poem at the start just to cultivate, this, just to prepare the space. And then the, for the rest of it, I am basically in the background. I'm just here introducing people. And then I got, I really enjoyed hosting and I love hosting so much, which is why I kind of got a little addicted to it. <laughs> Um, you with that with the with the free nights you're running got addicted to hosting. Yeah, it's actually fewer nights than uh, I was doing in like 2021, well, yeah, 2022. You, well, yeah, because you were and I say guest hosting, but like yeah. we'll, we'll get into that oh, later. Yeah. But like, cause, yeah, because yeah, there was there were nights. Yeah, we'll get into that later. We'll come back to pin yeah. in that one. But yes, but yeah, and then I think as a performer, because I've now like become fully comfortable in being funny, because well. First, I was like, I'm scared. I'm scared to be funny in poetry spaces. Then I got comfortable being funny. Then I'm like, okay, I actually have a lot of feelings that I do want to process with poetry. So let me put some seriousness in it. And now I am at a very comfortable place where I am able to blend the two. And I'm glad that I've made a name for myself doing that um, because I, I was worried that it would get gimmicky after a while, but also at the same time, I feel like because I got better as a writer, it's it hasn't felt gimmicky. It's like, okay, I'm now doing um, like workshops, teaching people how to incorporate comedy into their poetry. And I think that, yeah, I think that allows me to do like the main thing, which I said before is like, just working on the community stuff. Because yeah, I think with a lot of things that are going on, especially now, there are some things for me that are too serious to be a poem and where I'm like, it's not even a conversation anymore. It's now like we need action. So I want to, I want to do that. And one of the ways I do that through hosting is by just creating space. Um, Cause yeah, I often, I beat myself up a lot for what I believe to be not doing enough. And it's like creating and maintaining spaces where people can share is a good thing and I need to recognize that more. 
I almost want to pick you apart on the whole too serious to be a poem thing because I feel that a lot with some stuff a level of like I it's a weird balance in the scene of I think it's a really good thing that people are sharing a lot of their traumas and finding ways to process it etc talking about current affairs etc mm -hmm. and making sure they're putting light to it but there's always that balance between especially when you're putting stuff in front of an audience etc that level of I want to be doing a good performance that whilst it can be educational or raising awareness, et cetera, you are still a paying audience that is giving up your night for this. Mm. I want to not go lecture. I want to find that line between informing, but still being entertaining. Yeah. So I feel that I might, what I'm kind of going to go into as well, with especially your present side of things, you obviously got a lot of the funny stuff done, but you also have been incorporating some more politics in there. Admittedly, some of the politics with the funny as well. So is that like part of your present writing of like trying to balance, cut out funny, but what can I do with the funny, et cetera? Yeah, because I learned pretty early on that like, if you do make it funny, it stays memorable and um, it allows people to like, yeah, not necessarily take the situation less seriously, but view it with less hopelessness. Um, and I think that, yeah, when we are able to actually at least like laugh or smile or have some level of levity, it, it gives us some level of agency. Um, the, and I think that that is really good. And I think where it gets tricky is that for me personally, when it comes to like the act of writing and I'm like trying to write certain things, it's weird. Cause I contradict myself in the sense that like, for example, I often felt that a lot of poets need to act more about um, regarding what's happening in Palestine, but not only are, are so many poets already doing it. And what I should be doing is championing the poets who are doing it. Check out live winter and Usama. All right. Um, like th it's like championing the ones who are like doing the good work, but also, um, shit, I forgot my train of thought. I <laughs> forgot what I was saying. Um, so, uh, you can do it. I believe in you. I have faith in you. Thank you. Um, I, I can click for you if you want me to. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Finding, um, yeah. Finding the right balance of like having like, funny poetry when it's like too serious. Um, I, I think it's, I think like I do contradict myself because I say, Oh no, I shouldn't. Uh, so many of the things that are happening in Palestine, it's no longer a conversation. Even it's, we need to act, but also I am still writing about it because, and that, and what I write about it is still important. And I even see that with, like one poetry jam I had um, where like one of the poets, he wrote about it. And then that also inspired me to finish something that I had sort of had in a poem that I had had. I was like really struggling to like make work where I'm like, I'm trying to inspire people to do direct action, but in a way that can be very grassroots, very simple, very like, you can do this on a local level. You don't have to fully organize a team to go to Elbert's offices because that is very difficult. And yeah, it's like balancing all of that to make it funny. Um, I've always been able to do that because I rarely take anything in life seriously, but now I am getting to a point where I'm like, I need to start taking things seriously. Um, but yeah, I think the balance was easier because I started funny and went into serious. I think it's a lot harder for people going starting serious and going into funny poetry. No, it's like so it was definitely a thing I very much appreciate. In as much like I, whilst I will continue to get dangerously close to getting cancelled for all of the opinions I will express on express on poetry. It's always that vibe with some of these poems of like I whilst I respect the thought behind it, don't tell me that racism is bad. Don't tell me that the war in Palestine is bad. We kind of, you at poetry audience, yeah. we know that kind of thing. Yeah. It's level of what more are you telling me that I'm not getting from the news or the social media post you just shared? Yeah. Do more. And that's like one of the things that often, when I, in my writings, I, I try to make sure I'm hitting because I don't want to be like, 
did you know the IDF is bad? It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like, of course they are, but like, either you're going to tell us a story that we need to hear that is important, or you're going to tell us something we don't know. But then what I write a lot about is I like to write, I like to write scenes. So in the two things that I've done, which I've shared about Palestine, the first one is about just reflecting on seeing a protest outside like a BBC studio and seeing like the solidarity. And it's like, wow, this, this gives me hope. But then the immediate next day, seeing like just a standard contractor being hired to basically scrub off all of the stickers that were placed around the studio and reflecting on that was what birthed the poem because it's not it's yeah it's talking about like what do we do here what can we each do here and how the powers that be are constantly fighting to stop us so it's like yeah how do we how do we deal with a constant uphill battle um, and, and in writing that, I allowed myself to also have more ambiguous endings with my poetry, which I never really do. I like, I often, um, in, especially in my earlier poetry, like how straight am I, I like being very direct, but now I allow myself to be a bit more like, Hey, all we have is time. What are we going to do with it? And the other one is where I'm talking more about direct action. I'm saying, Hey, shoplift from your local Starbucks because they are contributing to the genocide. They like all of those stores are insured. So anything they lose, it's just going to raise their premiums. Like they are just underpaying their stuff because they can. And to write something really like, I guess, exemplifying the tangled web of fuck that deals with um, what I call the genocidal supply chain. I feel like, that is a more worthwhile story to share with a poetry audience that's like, okay, let's be entertaining, but also I kind of, it's a bit like Bob Villain, where I like to sort of like almost give an instruction manual on like what we are going to do next, because I think, I don't want to say a revolution is coming, but I think a lot of people want a revolution, but a lot of people don't realize, one, a revolution a good revolution require is like 60% Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so much organizing. Um, Rick Dove said it beautifully. Revolutions are cool, but they require cool heads. And it's like, how do we, how do we start working in a way to organize ourselves? And I want to be able to do that in a way that's like, okay, I want us to have fun. I don't not necessarily have fun. I don't want to berate and lecture people. But I also want to be like, okay, so here's what we're going to fucking do. And I think I'm doing an okay job of balancing it. But I also think that that's why hosting is a lot easier for me because it's like, I actually have a platform where like upon it, I can like, I can have a poetry jam and just because I want to, I can just lead the entire crowd and saying, fuck Dan Schneider because fuck Dan Schneider. Oh, that's my the very few times I check in on Facebook and oh that algorithm is algorithming <laughs> that thing of I've looked at one Dan Schneider thing and now it's like here were all the quotes from all the people about Dan Schneider and it's like cool like I mean this is now I am I was aware of it so thank you and it's like no you're telling me all the things and mm -hmm. yes fuck Dan Schneider and mm -hmm. fuck all of that yeah. but no it is an important thing to be doing and I guess looking now at the kind of future section of this where what do you want to do creatively going forward like it seems obviously like you're kind of the work has been adapted and growing as it is. Yeah. Where is is there a goal for the work? Is there an a thing you want to do, or is it just fucking around? Then soon to be finding out. A little bit of the last of fucking around because I I'm trying to find like I don't want to say stability because at this point I think that stability in the UK is a myth. Um, but I want to find a nice little happy medium where. The, th the spaces I cultivate kind of take care of themselves. So like, ideally what I would love for in the future is like if one third Tuesday of the month, I do want to take a little holiday and Poetry Jam just takes care of itself. Like they don't even need a host. Like people will just show up, the clock hits 7.30 and people just get on stage and share. And it's not because I don't want to host Poetry Jam. It's more that I like it when 
I want the space to be autonomous because then that means like it's actually doing it's really doing the work but but the but yeah I think a lot of what I want to do is I just want to keep I keep I want to keep making fun stuff I, I want to keep having fun with my artistry so I think a lot of that will be just doing random things um especially working a lot with George Lawrence to like do because he wants to do a lot more film-based stuff with me and I also want to do just I want to see like what what silliness we can get up to um so yeah ideally ideally if we can uh get the funding for it um I'd love to do like a poetry cooking show <laughs> where like I could invite poets round we like cook something and then we talk about either poetry or just food and like just stuff but also at the same time I don't necessarily need it to be content like I don't need it to be I I kind of want it to be just people having fun doing fun shit where that leads and how we do it I don't know um but yeah other than that um the future stuff that I still have planned that I'm trying to do trying to produce an album um but yeah beyond that I'm I'm really happy with where I am and what my work is doing but I think that's also because I've spent like the past several months like not having written anything new mm. and now that I have written a couple new things I'm like okay maybe I should keep writing stuff and also people keep badgering me to like finally like have a collect publish a collection and i'm like it's gonna be very difficult to like put shit on company time to a page i feel that like i am very happy with my collections but i was also aware that thing of like how much do these translate into mm. written form into book form yeah i think i was not lucky but whilst a lot of it is very much the in-person thing, a level of I do a lot of fourth wall breaking, which thankfully you can just about do mm. written down, like asides and notes to editors, authors, etc. Yeah. Thin Things in margins, all that kind of stuff, just about gets around a fourth wall break. The shit on company time one, like, I'd be curious, I'd be definitely very fascinated to see that written down kind of thing. And Yeah, see... The only way I can think of some of my poetry mm. being written is like is like if it's written like futurist poetry where there's just like a full um acceptance of just being really silly with the form and the structure mm. and almost like having shit on company time be over like several pages because like the word shit has to be in like size 70 <laughs> font but I'm not a very good formatter or graphic designer or editor. So I think I would definitely need to work with an editor and I need like a strong willed editor because I'm going to suggest a lot of dumb shit that I think looks cool, but doesn't actually work. One of the things I am aware that I have still not suggested in any of my books, but I kind of wanted to do, but I did it a couple of times when I was performing is I've got a really dumb thing called my black poem where I when I was performing it I just got an A4 sheet of paper printed the word poem on it and made sure it was just in big enough it's a whole A4 paper and look it's my black poem <laughs> which I kind of want to put in a book but I don't think I could get away with uh, see because I only I watched American Fiction last night I'd say you can at this oh, point yes. <laughs> I'd say like because yeah, I I definitely struggled a lot with uh the idea of like being a black poet and how like it's almost unavoidable to have your identity be a part of your work and your poetry, but also at the same time you don't want every aspect of your artistry to be intrinsically tied to your experience with white supremacy. So how do you how do you wrestle with that? And I I struggled with it a lot, but then I realized I am just going to embrace it in its fullness because I know that like my expression of blackness is a is not the most conventional, <laughs> but I think that that is that's what makes it valid. That's what makes it important. And also, I think that 
also just my personal opinion is like i'm glad that we are now at the point where we are no longer calling black kids oreos because they listen to rock music and i feel like we're now at a point where blackness is accepted as the multifaceted concept that it actually is rather than ah oh, you must only listen to hip hop and r&b your poems must only be hotepi the ongoing thing of it the i'm allowed to be a musical theater fan and like me being a musical theater fan admittedly there's a whole level of the campness and the how is tyrone still straight vibe to it forever but a level of black man listening to musical theater is not such a oh my god this is an actual cultured black man okay there's one of them in the world it's now. like oh where's your where's your sweater vest <laughs> no don't no because um when i was um in secondary school and those i think it was sixth form i was definitely a sweater vest guy <laughs> that was definitely I'm like, like i'm not even gonna lie there were facebook pictures no it's okay i i basically spent most of my teen years um trying to be kelly from block party Ooh. so so <laughs> I, I, it's I, it's I, I, need, I feel like i need to call him out on the podcast because i can i fucking can Derek is is kelly from block party <laughs> i'm he is he is i love you Derek. you are kelly from block party and you know that Ah, uh, no cool um i would be remiss though to end this future section without asking you about obviously you I say recently, time is a fucking weird concept. You recently had been playing out, playing around with the one man show and doing yes. a longer thing. Are there more longer things in the future, or was that just a let's do it and test it? And now we've ticked off a list kind of thing. Uh, there are longer things, but I want to do, I want to do things beyond a one man show. So I want to be like on the writing team of an actual long form television program. Um, I think that's where my next goal is because I think I've gotten so used to short form writing that maintaining a long narrative is something that I've almost, I haven't practiced maintaining the attention span for. And f without sounding like a colossal narcissist, there have been far too many shows and movies that I remember having an idea for that were then executed either better or as good as I could have possibly made them. And that makes me upset. And that means that I have to actually like learn the skills so that I can start like making stuff. Otherwise, yeah, it just feels like there is a, I do believe that there is a finite number of ideas that can exist and I need to get my ideas out so that yeah so that they can actually have life because i've spent far too many years afraid of either rejection or that i will never finish the thing and it's like no i need to actually start like i guess committing to writing big things yeah it's a nice way to end this section and then from that we are going to so we're going to go move into the let's talk about section okay. and i'm going to say out loud both for me and for podcast viewers more than listeners it's going to be that wonderful continuity as tyrone's going to suddenly change the drink he's holding for this next section because 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 continuity is a fun thing and tyrone needs more alcohol because <laughs> this is the vibe but i that I, is an in, yeah. important podcast <laughs> info that needed to be set, said right there. Could I also request that my water be magically transformed into a beer with the power of continuity? Oh, you... We will see it when I go to transition. <laughs> continuity. Boop. Um... Now we are moving into the section called Let's Talk About. We put a pin in it beforehand, mm -hmm. but now we're going to go into it somewhat in depth. We'll see how fucking tangential we go as well. Yeah. But we are talking about hosting and all of that fun oh, vibe. Joys. Uh, so I guess for context, let's go for at this present time, what events are you currently hosting? So... Currently, at this moment in time, I am hosting That Goddamn Poetry Jam, I'm hosting Riverside Rhymes, I'm hosting Extra Second London, and I am 
technically co-hosting word of mouth. Yes. Whereas f- the first three are all monthly. Yes. Whereas word of mouth is special S- occasions yeah. when we feel like it, whatever vibes. Yeah. Seasonal. With, yeah. yeah. Cool. So with that, um, and this is where I will ever so slightly give you your flowers in as much as in talking to people about hosting and going to events and how even I'm starting to do my new documentary thing, the n- names that seem to come up most hosting wise are Yomi Sode, Bogdan Piazetsky, and Kid and Nancy as hosts that people like a lot. That's what they do on other great hosts as well. I mean, there's a lot of love for Kat Francois as well. There's a lot of love for Vanessa, Vanessa Kasule as well. But your they name definitely your name definitely comes up a lot in the hosting and whatnot. So why hosting for you? I know we've touched on it a little bit, yes. Why hosting for you? Um so I I'm really big on just creating a space because it feels like this is the work that benefits the community and it's something that I'm good at um because I it's weird I'm I am able to navigate and manage social situations but I manage them best when they are more goal oriented so like when I'm hosting it allows me to be social but with a purpose so that way I can like greet people I can actually hang up hang out with them I can catch up with them and get and you know and you know we can have a good time but i don't feel like it's small talk um and i think that's mainly because i'm seeing so many people in one evening and also because it's a poetry night you're you're already like sharing and confronting like all the deep stuff so that just makes the one like like it allows me to socialize um in a way that like doesn't like run out my social battery too quickly and um and yeah i i think because i enjoy it um and i'm good at it like i just i will happily just keep doing it um which is why like i'm also big on like um Another service that I'm actually going to have for the future is uh, I do want to like sort of be a host for hire. So like if a poet is going on holiday, but they want someone to keep comparing. So so they want someone to compare their event so that like, you know, people are still there. Everyone's having fun. I would love to do that. Um, And yeah, I just I just enjoy support. Also, it's the act of supporting people, um, especially when it's like their first time and I like the variety that an open mic brings. Um, and I like how people who may have not performed in a while or performed at all can surprise me. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to, I put the pin in for, for late and the thing of like, I think, especially in UK, London, obviously, but UK as a whole, to be fair, there is that vibe with these posts because they are so guerrilla underground diy whatever phrase you want to attribute to mm-hmm. them there is that vibe of if you are host you are also producer event organizer yeah. as well you must be doing all these hats in one which is a wild one to think of because when you look at our sister arts things like music like theater like comedy like whatever there is that vibe of a music open mic night or music night or whatever will often have a producer who you will never see who books mm-hmm. an actual host etc then obviously with that I part of why I bring it up is obviously you've got things like word of mouth and you can correct me if I'm wrong here but my understanding from the outside looking in is whilst you are on that team you are basically on that team as host versus on that team as I'm planning the events and organizing yeah. the events as well so like yeah so organizing events um to be honest, organizing them isn't really that difficult. Mm. I think that, okay, maybe it's a bit <laughs> arrogant of me, but, yeah. but like, yeah, organizing it is just be be aw- be wary of time and just, if you need to, just have a list of all the things that need to be done. And sometimes that grows, sometimes it shrinks and just make sure that they get done. Um, 
Because, like, the one night, that the one event that I have that actually requires the most organization is the one that the least amount of people come to. <laughs> Good. Good. <clears throat> so I'm not saying that Extra Second London is bad. I love Extra Second London. It is my baby. But not enough people come to it because the venue is small and also it is very intense. Because you have the poetry, but you also have the discussion. And everyone who goes to the discussion loves it. It's always a good time, but it is a very intense time. It's more intense than just, hey, I'm just going to a poetry night just to chill and just listen to some stuff. Um, but yeah, when it comes to organizing, I also prefer organizing on my own because no disrespect to you, <laughs> but... I saw the chaos at Boomerang, <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and it's just, I, I rec it was like seeing the chaos at Boomerang and also seeing like, um, and seeing like when you have a poetry night with multiple people, when those people have certain jobs and tasks, you rely on them to do that. And I am really bad when working in teams like that because Either I will turn into an absolute asshole, which I've fortunately managed to avoid doing because like, I guess, uh, yeah, the inner thoughts of just like, just yell at him like you're Gordon Ramsay is just always there. But then I, but then I try to like, I guess, overcompensate by being like, no, nah, it's okay. It's okay. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. I'll handle it. And when I'm at that point, I'm like, I might as well just handle the whole thing myself, which I do prefer. And because of that, that's why I like having a night that takes care of itself because I want to, and you see this with Poetry Jam. I run it, I run it well, but I also run it in a way that's like, I keep it organized, but I also try to do it as lazily as possible. Um, because I don't want to, I don't want to try too hard to make it run because if you're trying too hard to make it run, then you're focusing on the wrong things. And also one thing I learned is that good hosting will make people come to a poetry night. So as long as I make sure that I have the energy to be responsive, like with the little things like, oh, there's not enough chairs, go get more chairs. Oh, it seems like things are dragging on a bit. Okay, maybe the next break is a little bit shorter than it usually is. And you just got to keep mindful of just, yeah, the little things that happen during the event. Other than that, honestly, the bit I really don't like about organizing event is just advertising. <laughs> no, I think, so this is the whole fun joke of, uh, in my 32 years of living, I am at this moment in time working on my delegating skills. <laughs> As we know, Tyrone films things and takes <laughs> pictures of things and... The the fact that I will host process and do a lot of advertising for process and take pictures at process and film process and do all of that as level of a Tyrone. Sometimes you can <laughs> share some of these things out. So they're yeah. like, but you know, there's very much things I add to myself. But it is I do, and again, not even the secret thing, but a level of like, I think once you've got the night started, there's some level of it runs itself. It's easy, yeah. like. The difficult part, obviously, will always be getting the audience in the first place. Once people have got into the rhythm of it, for the most part, it's fine. Like, the hardest process to run was the first process. Mm. Once you've got that set up, though, it's fine. And, like, on that as well, like, Kayla in them being a really good director, really good theatre person, as I'll keep saying the joke or whatever, they often can be busy at times. Therefore, there have been a couple of processes where... Kayla's been out of action, but we've been able to substitute someone in as a guest host, whether it was Bethany Down or my mum or, or PJ, mm. and it's still been process. Yeah. So, like, I feel you that on the whole running of it. I think with that as well, though, and this is to almost go back to the spoken word London days, the question challenge of these are all fine and good until something bad happens or something wrong happens or yeah. a poet goes up and says something that you don't want them to say. So I am very lucky in that that has not happened yet. My only thing to bring up though, and I feel like you was hosting, hosting Smoking with London after 
they were doing it. And I will fucking name people because I fucking can because I'm Tyrone. Speak your truth, King. The joke a lot of the time, both at Unislam, at Process, a lot of these events, is when we're doing our starting spiel, the whole no kicking down, no sexism, no racism, but also there is the added one of no nudity. Hmm. Yeah. I there are that. one or two poets, I'm very aware that they've spoken with London, who love getting their kit off. Yeah. Who love getting their kit off. Okay, like real talk, I'm going to say it, and it's kind of controversial. I support, here's the thing. <laughs> I support it because when it was done at VFD, the thing about VFD as a venue is that it was strictly uh, 18 plus. Yes. And when it's at like other places, I, I am a, I support the use of nudity in one's poem. However, I am a much bigger supporter of give a of that being part of a content warning yes and mm. i think that blindsiding people with your todger is a bit is it's not that it's bad it's more that it doesn't give people the agency to uh deal with it their way but i but yeah i am glad that i have spoken with similar because like honestly Having to explain to people because, like, post pandemic, when we had when we started actually getting complaints mm. about the nudity at Spoken Word London, it was the hardest thing, and I was so scared that Hannah was like, "Don't worry, I'll take care of it," <laughs> because I was I was literally too nervous to basically like say to people who, like, yeah, I had seen perform and who I was cool with what they did, but also I understood why other people weren't. And pre-pandemic, it was cool because like VFD as a venue pre-pandemic, it was it was kind of what it it was very obvious from the get-go that this is I mean, VF, VFD for people who have never been there. They have uh, in the toilets there. I don't know if they still got them now, but like big old di dicks, yeah, big old dicks in the toilets. Like, like it's a gay club. Such was a gay club. Yeah, it's like, it's like a it's an L yeah. So it's a queer venue featuring like. Like they have, they have sex nights. They, yeah. they have like sex club nights and everything. So, <clears throat> because I knew what the place was like, I'm like I understand and I accept it. But, and I'll say I am also glad in a sense that since the pandemic, the poach like more people have shown an interest in poetry. But because of that, we've had to be a bit more active in the safeguarding. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's perfectly fine to do that. It's just, it bothers some folks, but also I'm like, ah. it's It's a difficult one to balance because there's a thing of like, in general, I don't think like, art and nudity can definitely go together. It was, again, I think it's the, again, it still goes into that consent warning side of things. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not going to leave the room if someone puts up on that dead dick, but a level of like, give me the warning first and like oh so hannah swingler says it well so i, I, I go to uni, uni slam um every year i'm the media person for that and like one of their big things is put, if you've got anything that could be potentially triggering in your poem put a content warning at the start of your poem it's a slam but a level if you say your content warning content warning is not going to count at any part of your timing do because yeah. the, the content warning is more important than timing with that Hannah Swingler's vibe, as she always said, is level of, if you feel your content warning is going to ruin the shock factor of your poem, it's not a good poem. Yeah. Like, if the content warning spoils your poem, it's not a good poem. Sorry. Yeah. Honest, I agree, because um, I'm really glad that, like, very early on, I understood content and trigger warnings to be what they are because there was this like this is like really old youtube but there was this really great youtube channel called pbs idea channel mm -hmm. and in it he basically and and it, and it was just this dude um just putting forward like philosophical questions and in it one of the things he said is like trigger warnings don't prevent dialogue they actually Cre they actually like uh help dialogue and it's because it actually allows people to establish what the hell is going on because i have 
seen what happens when you actually introduce something to people without any warning. And it doesn't actually help people learn. So I'm going to tell you a little motherfucking story. <laughs> so back when I was a teacher, um, it was... Uh, I'm going to tell you the story about uh, the thing that happened that made me quit teaching. <laughs> Good. So it's Black History Month, and I'm a teaching assistant for students with special education needs and disabilities. And like my class, I love my class. My class loves me. But the main classroom teacher, she and I have some philosophical differences. That's polite. And... During Black History Month, there's a f couple problems that occur. Like the first problem, which I was, which was like elevating my blood pressure, was um, she basically managed to make uh, our discussion on Black History Month about her. So we, so basically the the head of the, I guess the course, um, the B Tech course, had given uh, all of the teachers a bunch of black lead shows and movies for the kids to watch because it's like okay george floyd died a few months ago we gotta look like we care and i'm like you know what it's something like i've had to deal with some terrible things like if you want a truly truly fun fun time um ask any person who is a teacher or especially any black teacher about like black history month at like public schools because it's a it's a doozy so um so yeah we have this list of tv shows and movies and then five minutes in she starts to like commandeer the whole like discussion and talk about how she whose father was born in british occupied india her her father who was born and raised and lived in british occupied india had a bit of a tan and then because of that the girls at school would say that your dad's black and then she would be really sad about that so she understands racism <laughs> and then like not like a week later uh then comes into like the lack of trigger warning point so she then decides to pick a film for us to watch because she hasn't prepared anything for the lesson and what does she put on at 9 30 a.m it was i mean it was like 9 45 a.m on a tuesday 12 years a slave no trigger warning just raw and but when i say that I have never seen <laughs> a more uncomfortable group of kids because they understood. They were like, well, clearly, yes, this is about slavery. Like, but we need to give these kids extra context for so many things. And you're just not even giving them any, co they're going raw, raw into 12 years a slave. And it was a truly terrible experience. I was so mad. Like, I felt so bad for the kids because, like, they were so uncomfortable and they weren't able to, like, adequately process what was going on. So because of that, one of the kids wound up laughing because he was so nervous, all right? But because, like, the teachers didn't, genuinely didn't understand how neurodivergence works, she sees this kid laughing, gets upset with him, and I'm like, you cannot be here. <laughs> A white woman yelling at a black child on Black History Month because you decided to put on 12 Years a Slave at 9.45 in the morning. Like, most of these kids ain't eating breakfast yet. It's what, on a, on that tangent from it, it's why one of my favorite poems to perform of late is doing my Too Black, Too Furious poem, which... Whilst, and I don't say it's like anything close to the best thing I've ever written. It's one of my favourite ones to perform to a majority white audience in a majority white place. I went to Brighton to do it recently. And there was that, it was that wonderful level of, is it funny or is it really uncomfortable? I don't know. And I'm laughing out of nervousness and the, am I allowed to laugh here? Is that, was that a joke or was I that? for that shit. Oh, fully. <laughs> oh, that's my. Fully, ah. Oh, I live for yes it. <laughs> it's that thing of like i'm saying it as a somewhat joke and it's that thing of like am i allowed to i don't know if i'm allowed to laugh and like even with like my fucking grandma gears one which is even more silly it's that thing of i love doing joke followed by a very serious line 
and especially performing that because you'll get people, hopefully, that are still laughing as you do the serious line and then they feel really bad because they were still laughing. <laughs> and it's like, no, nah, that's kind of that, that, that level of schadenfreude or whatever. It's like, no, I love, I live for that shit. I do, me too. Like, I do love it. But yeah, I think I do understand how some people might feel regarding <laughs> trigger warnings because I did speak to one poet and she was like, for her, trigger warnings are very complex. Yeah. So therefore, she doesn't really understand why people like insist on trigger warnings. And I'm like, just because it's not, just because like certain words, it's, it's like she's more triggered by like certain smells yeah. than certain words. Mm. And it's like, but you need, and it's like, because there's smells, she can't really like, she doesn't have the level, same level yeah. of agency to prevent it from happening. But I'm like, yes, but there are a lot of things, especially that we talk about in poems that if you aren't actually like ser if you don't like put trigger warning, it does fuck up a person's night. I have seen, like I've seen it at poetry night where like someone came on, did a poem about their trauma, did not do a trigger warning. And I, and I will see people in the audience, like, like not really being able to leave and like take care of themselves because it will look like they're just walking out of the poem and they're, and yeah, it just, the rubbing of agency is very real because whilst everyone is here to share and everyone is here to have a good time, also everyone has the right to know what they're getting themselves into. Well, like as host and make tiny sense an interesting conversation here, a level of like, where do you as host fall in that? How responsible are you for looking after the audience? When, where do you jump in? Where is that line? Especially, obviously, and this is one of the things that I want to try and be as honest, honest as I can about, a level of, in it being so DIY, so guerrilla and all that stuff, whilst is in the best intentions as possible, at the start of every night, we'll say a level of no kicking down, yeah. don't this kind of stuff. I will say some level of no transphobia or whatever. I am not up to date with all of my trans research knowledge, etc. So there is every chance that someone says something that is a little bit transphobic and I don't pick up on it, etc. or whatever. And someone might mention it afterwards or someone might be feeling comfortable they didn't even pick up, etc. So where are you in that line between I am here to host tonight and to keep that going, we also need to look after the audience? Um, so yeah. I, I can't... Okay, so this is going to sound really weird, but I often think of when it comes to the housekeeping... I always try to emulate the Dean from Community <laughs> in the sense that- I need to see where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really big on like um, just polite updates mm -hmm. because if I actually have to inter- because like the thing I really want to- I want to be preventative more than reactive. Yes. And that's for me my biggest thing. And the thing is like real talk, I am just very lucky to have been graced with an open mic audience and open mic participants that haven't really crossed any lines, so to speak. Like the closest thing we had to a line being crossed was like sometimes people forget a trigger warning. But beyond that, like I've been I've been to some pretty crazy poetry nights where um like Due to the hosts wanting there to be like as much freedom as possible, they end up allowing some real fuck shit to happen. And then, and I feel bad and I end up feeling so bad for them. I'm like, it's okay. And they're like, it's not okay that they said that. And I'm like, I know it's not okay that they said that, but because you are aware that it's not okay, that's all I need. Um, because sometimes like, yeah, you're going to get blindsided. So all you can do is just... Sometimes you can't intervene. All the things you can do is just um, do some aftercare and just say like, hey, just letting we us all. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes even just call the break after that particular poet and just like, we're going to take a break. Hey, if anyone needs to take care of themselves, do so. And yeah, deal with it accordingly. Um, yeah, I haven't had to deal with any like genuinely offensive poets uh, yet. Um, but you want to, no. God no! I, <laughs> the way how I want to avoid it so bad because we because I remember there being this one extra second London where it started to be like that, 
um, because this one this one dude came on and he was like, this is a breakup poem. And I thought, okay, it's just going to be a breakup poem. And then he basically was like, you dumb bitch. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh no, like people are getting real. This is mm-hmm. not good. Mm-hmm. So then I like, I remember Julie and I actually had to stop at midway and just be like, this is not okay. Um, w- the worst one we've had, there was a process once when one of our, I don't think they were regular, but they've come a couple of times, had signed up for the open mic, they'd left their notebook at home. So like, well, fuck it, I've got a poem on my phone, I'll do this one. N- us not realizing that this is a guy who is almost just this week been dumped after a long-term relationship. And it was just the I hate my ex mm-hmm. poem. And wow. it is one of the few times me, they can go called an audible and like, yeah, your five minute slot is now two minutes. No, you're done now. Time's up. Yeah. So, so, sorry, no, cool, you're done. Get off stage, please. I think sometimes you have to intervene. It's never, it's never fun. I remember there was one, I never, I never saw this happen. I only heard about it, but I, I guess like, my idea of what the standard is so it was at a jaw dance and basically one of the open micers had tried to compare eating meat to participating in slavery (laughs) cool 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 Um, cool cool and then afterwards um yomi basically was like that was fucking unacceptable Mm. if anyone needs to talk to me uh, if anyone need, like, if anyone needs to talk and was made uncomfortable by that, like, come see me. But like, he basically just like drew a hard line and was like, "We at Apples and Snakes and at Jaw Dance do else, not endorse that. <laughs> do not endorse this at all." So, I, so, so, so when I get up, up at um, goddamn Poetry Jam and do my OJ Simpson was innocent poem, what are you doing on stage afterwards? It depends on how funny it is. <laughs> <laughs> god. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> no, like as as much as <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. No, cuz like specifically on the subject of OJ Simpson is innocent. <laughs> I would I would laugh so hard if someone did that, that if they were serious about it, they would be so discouraged because like I'm also like when I'm laughing, it won't even be like a hit. It will be like, ha, 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 ha. I'll be like slapping yeah. my knee and shit. Like, so uh, yeah, I will probably fuck up the situation myself by being myself. Um, <clears throat> but if someone wants to do like a, hey, give Nigel Farage a break poem. Honestly, um, and this sometimes happens when, and I want to make it very clear. It's not when the poem is bad. It's just when the poem is not very good. Mm-hmm. I will basically just be like, all right, give it up for them one more time. And I just, I just, yeah, I just, just move on. Well, like, cause like with that as well, and this is where, especially something, and I go back to Spec Road London a lot on this one. Cause I feel like in the best and most awkward possible way, Spoken Word London was the most open of the Spoken Word nights. Mm-hmm. But the challenge, obviously, and I will be, again, ironically, after this, we're going to be doing an interview about my new show documentary thing where we'll probably talk on this as well. But, like, it's that challenge of an open mic night where we're open, but also don't say this shit. Yeah, I'd say that it's not, I'd say that that's not a problem and it should never be well, a problem. And I, I disagree with anyone who says, oh, but my freedom of expression. And I'm like, listen, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. I remember um, Hazel Mehmet said it best because they run uh, like an erotic night for shits and scribbles Mm -hmm. and they have like an erotic confession and then some people will write some fuck shit. Mm -hmm. They will literally write like, I am a groomer. I assaulted someone. And then they'll be like, hey, this is an anonymous space, but it's not judgment free. And on a tangent, I am sad. I don't think I ever brought you to a smut slam, did I? Oh no, I went to the smut slam. I, I won the smut slam. I did bring you to one. I, I did. I did at one point. Yeah, because smut slam is your vibe, and like, yeah, I'm. They okay. are very good at that level of a uh, whatever we do here. It's under the banner of it's still consensual. Yeah, I. Oh man, I. I also just want to take a quick tangent to say I'm really upset that I was way too humble when I won my first smut slam. <laughs> 
Because here's what happened. Here's what happened. Because I remember- Here's the thing. Because there were prizes available and there was a Hitachi that was like one of the prizes. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, I really want that Hitachi. But I remember my ex didn't fuck with Hitachis. But- You could have. I could have. You literally could have fucked with Hitachis. (laughs) But um, but yeah, so, um, so yeah, like I will forever like hold on to that regret. I should have gotten the Hitachi because I'm just there like, damn. (laughs) <laughs> no because like they're expensive <laughs> no no like yeah on, on your point i do agree and I, I that whole i think the general vibe of like it's open but it's not judgment free and it's level yeah. of like it's that wonderful balance of you are allowed to say whatever you want to and you could genuinely be a quote-unquote nice person in all of your life but happen to be a nigel farage fan i find that weird as a concept to visualize but in the same bracket of not all Tories are the worst human beings in the world kind of vibe, etc. all of that thing, a level of like, there are some Tories that are very positive with art and all that stuff. I mean, hell, fucking, I stayed up late last night to watch wrestling because I'm a big wrestling fan. I cheered for the walk in the main event, even though he's a very big Republican, etc. <laughs> that thing of like, there is some separation you can do with that and art versus artist and whatnot. An ultimate level of like, if you genuinely are a Nigel Farage fan and write a pro Nigel Farage poem and write it as beautifully, eloquently as you can do, you're allowed to say it on stage. Yeah. I can choose to also not like it. Yeah. And I think that because there is such an expectation of support, I think that some people take that a little too far um, and expect to be supported regardless. No matter what. Yeah. And it's like, if you are only relying on the support rather than your actual skill you need to have a conversation with yourself because if that like i don't know how to tell a person in in a way that isn't massively condescending hey it's not really like you are doing art selfishly (laughs) if you own if you're only like sharing it so that you can be supported because essentially what you're seeking is corroboration it's not even validation it's like you want people to agree with you or you want to feel like they agree with you so that you can feel justified in continuing what you're doing when in reality we are all here to share and it's because ultimately there is a at the crux of all of us in our within our humanity there is a desire to share and to share in love and togetherness and community and if your idea of commute, and it's like, you can have poems of catharsis, you can have poems about how upset you are with your ex, but it's like, <clears throat> there is a way to, it's not, well, both there is a way to do it, but also like, if you are that obsessively angry that you're like, my ex is a bitch, I hate you. I, I'm just like, my guy, do like, find something else because I feel like, you you started poetry a bit too early. Process this shit, grieve this shit a little, and then write some poetry about it. I mean, it's also that thing as well of like, we are humans and you tell this story and what could be a very human thing and it happens with your friends at a bar, it happens wherever. You start telling the story and then someone kind of goes, actually, you're the bad guy here. And it's like, I, yeah. I thought I was in the right and you were. Yeah. I would be remiss also in this whole kind of conversation to not give a shout out to Ricky Livermore, who used to host Forget What You Heard About Spoken Word. They did one of my favorite hosting things. You kind of touched on a little bit the idea of, but like, there was one Spoken Word London when, no, in no offensive way, but people just happened to be talking a lot about like, they, and they were given trigger warnings or not beforehand, but talking about like taking of lives and suicide. And it was all very, very heavy shit. And I was like, there was like three poems in a row that were just really, really heavy. And Ricky said, we're having a break now. Yeah. Just, just, there's not time for a break. We're just going to have a break now. It's like that level of, I will always love that level of calling an audible and that kind of way. And that thing of like, even if the night has a structure, no, this needs a break now. Yeah. We love that. I think like it requires, like good hosting requires a level of like, you kind of have to be con- like awake. and you, just- Yeah, you've got to be present. Yeah, you got to be present in what's happening. You got to be like observing the audience, and in doing that, like, yeah, I think that that is that's the difference between like a host and a really, really good host. Mm. Um, like, I, I think that it's 
and it becomes easier over time because the things that you haven't practiced are the things that are difficult, which is why like, I am very scared about having to like kick someone out <laughs> because I've never had to uh, do like, we, we will keep saying, if you start saying something offensive on stage, we will kick you off midway through. It's like, I mean, we won't. Is but, but, <laughs> yeah. like, 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 don't put that person a test there. Yeah. Like, I don't have my comically large hook to hook you off stage. Okay, real talk, real talk. Real you talk. want the hook, don't you? I want the hook <laughs> so bad. <laughs> the hook to go with your throne. Okay, polite suggestions. I know you've got the drum, mm-hmm. but comically large hook when they go over time. Start pulling them off when, like, you've hit your four minute 20. Oh, you're in, you're in four minutes 30. You're fine. Four minutes 45. Mm, five minutes. Hook you yes. off the stage. Honestly, I see, I will do it. I don't want to. Um, I remember, like, I had one open mic offer to, like, buy me the hook, but I might just. There will be one poetry jam. I'm going to say it, like, Cause there's, cause the camera is there. Um, it'll hold me to my word. <laughs> I will get a shepherd's hook, uh, for people who go over five minutes at poetry jam. Uh, not because I think it's necessary to like physically manhandle people, but just because it's funny for me. <laughs> no, I would, and I will be here for that. But uh, <laughs> as we're kind of wrapping up this, let's talk about the section in the vague things of hosting and whatnot. Um, obviously, you've got the history with Spoken with London and then Riverside Rhymes and Goddamn Poetry Jam were there, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, were all nights that basically didn't do features. Yeah. But obviously, obviously um, Extra Second London does have features. So, like, as host slash organiser slash all that stuff, where do you lie on that whole features, purely open mic nights, mix of both, blah, 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 spectrum scale thing okay. whatever so i don't have features at Ri- so i'm going to probably have occasional features at riverside rhymes but the only reason i tend to not have features at goddamn poetry jam even though we did a couple times really early on is because deciding on features is time and i don't want to do that um like literally the only reason i don't do features most of the time is because i'm yeah fuck it i'll say i'm lazy i'm (laughs) i'm I'm lazy and i don't wanna and it means that i'd have to like do more organizing and i want i want the nights to be just fun and open and simple and that's why i don't really do them I do think feature having features is really good for a poetry night it brings up poets and it gives them a platform and it allows them to experiment. And I think that's why I've always been big on having it for extra second because we have features and we have the themes and we have the um, discussion. So all of them align together, which makes, which keeps it interesting. But, um, but yeah, if I, cause I, yeah, I remember when I was starting Riverside, I, and I said to them, yeah, we might have features, might not. And then once it actually started like rolling on, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do features, even though we definitely could, but I just can't be asked. <laughs> but we might do them later because like, because I have so much creative control, especially over Riverside Rhymes. Um, also, this is just going to be a fun little like advertisement. I will be premiering my one man show at a Riverside Rhymes this summer. It will either be July or August, um, probably August. Um, well, so everyone else is doing their shows at Fringe, you're going to do it at Riverside Rhymes. July. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, I think this kind of, it's kind of amused, like, I get the lazy thing, and this is arguable, but not in the many reasons of having Kayla do process with me. One, I need to not do everything myself. Two, Kayla's a really, really good person. And you can flip that one and two all around to show mm-hmm. where you want it. But like, it's good to have that. And I think what was nice for me with having Kayla and similar when I was doing Boomerang with that crew was the feature thing definitely brought me out of my comfort zone was I'm in somebody's features level of, I've not heard of this feature. I don't mm. go to tonight. It's nice to bring some features in. Yeah. But on that flip side of it, it is with 
the demise, yeah, that was so dramatic, of Spoken Word London. I know there's another one that's called Spoken Word London in Wood Green that does exist, and I have... A word? I have a... No, I'm fucked up, because I didn't even know about that. Oh, like, no. So shout out to the Wood Green Spoken Word London. Oh, I, yeah, I, 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 saw it, I saw it on um an Instagram, and it's like, oh, choices, okay, that's Spoken Word London again. That's a thing, okay. But... With the end of Spoken Word London, there, and also with obviously there being no poetry unplugged because of the poetry cafe issues and whatnot, mm-hmm. it's that thing of whilst, yes, born from laziness, there is a level of this scene does need a couple of purely open mic nights, oh, yeah. which gets more people on and does. I love a feature. I love. I'm from a school of. I want to put on a really good show. I wanted to have some level of peaks and troughs in it. So building it around the features, knowing that mm. there'll be guaranteed entertainment here and I can advertise it to people. I say advertise it, but like I can bring my friend who's not a poet along and they'll enjoy it, etc. And yeah. I've got a thing there. And not that you can't do that at events that don't have features, but that thing of it's nice to have a space where poets just come do poetry. Yeah. There's, there's no games or anything like that or anything like that. I mean, there's games because it's you, but <laughs> a level of t- poets, poets perform. That's what we're yeah. doing. I think that it's it does make it easier. And I, I do, because like, yeah, I think also like going to Spoken Word London so many times and then helping Hannah host it, it led to me genuinely falling in love with the open mic. Um, and I am really big on that. Um as for games, shout out to the the great game of Is It a Sandwich? I will forever be your one hater in every <laughs> single room for that. You say that you're a hater, but deep down you love it. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Like, like again, it's very much, it's very much panto hate. <laughs> it's panto hate at this stage. We all know this, but it's not going to lie. I'm also a little bit aware of like panto hate. Whoever I'm sitting with makes them into it more as well. They love how much Tyrone hates it. <laughs> you know what? I I really, because my girlfriend mentioned it, one of my favorite things, mm-hmm. uh, or at least one of the most interesting things, is the fact that um, when people... So uh, let me explain the game of Is It A Sandwich <laughs> for the people who don't know. So, the, the game is Is It A Sandwich? Yeah. End the here, end if the game. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what needs to be explained. You're right, you're right. I'm already over explaining it. But whatever, but yeah, at Poetry Jam, whenever we play um, Is It A Sandwich, and then I offer two suggestions that um, that require people to use their like creative, uh, create, creative muscles a little bit. When people are like, so when I'm saying something like um, a pop tart versus a Cornish pasty, and then people will be like, a, a Cornish pasty isn't a sandwich. And I'm like, where is your imagination? We are poets. We are poets. <laughs> The Have- metaphor. What's a metaphorical <laughs> sandwich? But honestly, the best, the best. I I love more that I get suggestions for it now. Mm-hmm. So I had um, Avulians suggest what we did for like one of the more recent ones, which was a kangaroo versus a tortoise. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, nah. Um, I'm gonna end this section there. <laughs> Calling, calling that a thing there. <laughs> Title card come up as we're going to go into our last section with the slow fire questions. Mm-hmm. That is, yeah. Oh. With the sandwich debate out of the way, we are now going into our wonderful final section known as slow fire questions. Right. Obviously, I have my long quick fire, I have my long list of quick fire questions, which you go through fast and level of feck it. Let's take some time on some of them. Okay. So we're going to do five at random and actually answer them, give them some time to breathe. I don't know why I've said it very chill and mm. cool like this, but I have because like we're like vibing it. and w- I, w- <laughs> I should not be allowed to host things. Despite the fact that I host all these things, I should not be allowed to host things. Nevertheless, give me a number between one and a hundred, please. Uh, 42. Of course, starting off with the meaning of life. The first question is, will poetry ever be mainstream? I think it already is mainstream, or at least it's growing... <laughs> It's it's in the direction towards mainstream, um, and I am gonna I'm gonna say it and I'm gonna declare it. So I think there was a time 
it basically, I want to say it started sometime between when No Name had an NPR concert, her first NPR concert, and when To Pimp a Butterfly dropped, where there was, where like it sort of began a bigger push to bring poetry, or at least the idea of poetry and poems that are poems into the mainstream. And I think that that, um, yeah, I think that that was, that began it. And I think that it's becoming more and more common because if poetry, like also other things that made poetry a lot more mainstream, life and rhymes made poetry a lot more mainstream. And I feel like a lot, and I would say like it is becoming a lot more mainstream because more people are coming to, especially in London, more people are coming to open mic nights when, you know, back in the pre-pandemic, most people, like some open mic nights, there would be like five people there and that would be it. And it would still be a good night. But like nowadays, there's like way more people who want to both create and share poetry. I definitely say like the urge to write poetry is more mainstream now, though than performing it just because even though there's like so many nights in London, I feel like even more than nights in London, there are so many poetry workshops in London. Um, and the staggering magnitude of those shows that people really want to like learn to write and embrace that aspect of writing. Yeah, I definitely agree with that level of like i mean my vaguely i need to update that question because i think that I've, I've been having it i've asked it many times again and these are questions that are old but i think of like i mean poetry is taught in every school across the country kind of thing yeah. so poetry almost by definition is mainstream in that sense and yeah. like i think the silent asterisk beside it is spoken word poetry is what yeah. we're kind of dealing with there i'd say like spoken word poetry is definitely like on a good trajectory to be mm. mainstream and I would say that, like, that is due to a lot of people within the community making, like, really great moves to, like, push that forward. Like, even though I know that we as a community um, are continuously giving, like, Yomi Shode his flowers, I think that what we he... We should give him more? I think that... <laughs> I mean, we should anyway, but yes. Yeah, I think that... A little bit, yeah, a little bit more. But both him and Caleb Femi just really bringing, um, like, at least, like, their contributions to bring poetry into the mainstream. Um, even Harry Baker as well. Like, there are so many uh, poets that are... Your Holly McNeish's, your yeah, exactly. um, Kay Tempest's. Especially yeah. Kay Tempest. I, um... Actually, on the Caleb Femi, um, Yomi Sode thing, I am very much looking forward to... I know it's not just the two of them, but, like, I am looking forward to Teresa Lola joining them in the I've been published by Penguin mm -hmm. group of people and just that level of, okay, cool, you are Penguin published and probably going to, at the very least, be nominated for, if not win the forward prize because you guys are going to be that level forever kind of yeah. vibe. And, yeah. And I think that... For me, the biggest thing of, like, poetry being mainstream, for me, it's, like, it's poetry and spoken word that is, in essence, contemporary, or at least, like, how we view contemporary poetry from people who themselves are digital natives. I think that that becoming part of the mainstream is both really great and it's happening now, and I think that we are... We are witnessing something truly amazing because I do also believe Big Man Ting, like a lot of the writers have been at the forefront of like pushing a lot of the cultural zeitgeists. Mm -hmm. I think the tricky thing, however, is how like future hits to funding are going to treat us because I'm not saying because like. This is a little tinfoil hat conspiracy theory, but I do think that over time, especially after everything that happened earlier this year, the Arts Council is going to be on very precarious footing. I mean, it's not even just Arts Council. You look at um, the same, I, f I feel like the same day, if not the same week I went to Birmingham, it was also announced that Birmingham's culture fund is cut to nothing. Yeah. And it's like... 
I'm going to Birmingham for this poetry festival, and there's very few places in the UK that have a poetry festival happening. What the Hippodrome has made accessible with both people have funding, obviously, but mm-hmm. the Hippodrome also being very receptive to that. It's like, oh, this is really good. And, oh, you're going to have no money in Birmingham to do any of these things. Like, obviously, Arts Council is different to yeah. that Birmingham funding, but... I'd say, like, it's almost just the general sense of relying on... Because, like, it's it's an, it's an a special kind of fuckery. Because mm. the UK and people really don't realise just how much of a powerhouse of culture and, like art we produce and i mean it's the now taken down um conservatives tweet the other day mm. where they were saying that we are the second most powerful country in the world and part of why it was taken down is because in their montage picture they used for it they used what a canadian car a u.s jet they also used a picture of the royal family which is against royal protocol to use in the pub in a party political <laughs> post etc but they also use things like christopher nolan look he's british he's a filmmaker we do that he's ours and it's like you can't really say that when because like i only found out about this a couple weeks ago that there was a film council okay so yeah there was used to be a film council the only reason we have films like slumdog millionaire was because of funding from the film council british film council yeah and then uh, basically, two thousand, sometime between two thousand and ten to two thousand twelve, gone. Like it was just, it was just immediately dissolved. And I think one of the biggest things is that we are going to have to work a lot more on um, grassroots stuff, and that a lot more artists, as we like push things to be mainstream, we have to understand that. Be- thing like poetry being mainstream doesn't mean like every poet is going to make money it means that poetry is going to become an industry and when poetry becomes an industry it means that it lends itself to a lot more exploitation the challenge and thing to that question is mainstream and profitable are annoyingly two different things exactly um give me another number please uh 39 39 we are now going for how regularly do you write not enough um well so I'm really pleased with myself this month because I wrote like three new poems. Napa Rhymo or just in general? Uh, just in general. I mean, actually, like, those were in March. So mm-hmm. I want to write something. For... Thing is, every time I say like, oh, I'm going to do something for Napa Rhymo, I don't. <laughs> and you know what? April 30th, I forgive myself. <laughs> I want to write more. Um, I, I like being able to write regularly, but... Um, I'm often plagued with very long bouts of writer's block um, because, um, yeah, let me just get honest with you. Like, I have really, really, really bad anxiety. And one of the biggest ways in which, like, I beat myself up due to my anxiety is, well, sorry, one of the worst manifestations of my anxiety is me beating myself up for a lack of productivity. And that only makes me less productive. So for like a good while, pretty much from November till a couple weeks ago, actually writing has been very difficult. But I was okay with that because I'm like, hey, I'm just focusing on the nights I run and just making them like cushy and all that. And I basically use that technicality to trick myself into not feeling guilty. But yeah, I, I am... I'm always anxious to write more and like I always keep trying to push myself to write more but a lot of that it leads to me forcing myself to write which leads to like poems that aren't necessarily great but I do feel good that I wrote something and I think that and I've become more comfortable with the idea of forcing myself to get up and write because it's like it's not just it it's for me it's like the difference between writing as a hobby and writing as vocation like writing as your job writing as your like career it's like sometimes even when you aren't in the mood you have to push yourself because this is this is your living this is your livelihood and so you have to 
be proactive in that sense. Um, the, the irony I have there is I actively keep poetry as the hobby in that I don't have to keep writing all the time. I have my breaks, my gaps, my... I don't need to write right now. And admittedly, part of that is because I can then... I love the documenting of it as clearly yeah. shown as data, so I don't mind not always being the center of attention yeah. or whatever. Also, to give you your flowers, mm. um, I don't think that Poetry Jam would be as popular as it is without your photography. Which is why I'll be ashamed when I'm not there and I'm watching Nickelback. Oh, no, it's okay. You you send so many photos and you take You're so many fine. photos. Well, we've got months got months backed up so yeah it's all good no like i i am very much a thing of like uh, so like almost like going back a bit to the whole thing of you saying like cool like you should do a poem that starts at night and then you kind of cool thing a level of like a lot of the times when i do poems at open mic nights it's a level of like i want to promote the night i'm running and i kind of have to do a poem after that as well <laughs> it's that kind of thing or, or, or that thing of like I want to compliment these random open mic associates for the first time to tell you that your poem is good, but calling it what it is, some level of you will take me more seriously. My feedback will mean more mm. if I've also got on the mic with you this same night kind yeah. of thing. And not that random audience member does not mean anything, but if it's just the random audience member saying, oh, your poem was good, I'm like, cool, thank you. Yeah. Whereas... Oh, as vain as I can be, if it's the poet that just did a good poem on the mic comes up and says your poem is also good, it's level of cool. This means more, and now there can be something going on. Yeah, yeah. I think it's. I often talk about like, um, like the the work of community, and I often think that how you like that, like getting on the open mic and sharing, is part of your contribution contribution to like basically be a steward to your community um because i believe that like stewardship of community is like that's literally what mm. keeps it alive and i think that like yeah giving allowing yourself to like i wouldn't say push yourself because like i say like you know whenever you're like if you're not in the mood you're not in the mood don't ever force yourself to like perform because I always say, like, yeah, don't be Elton John in the 80s, okay? <laughs> like, don't push yourself against, like, your own comfort. But if you know that it would be good for you to get out of your comfort zone, I always encourage it. And, um, and yeah, I think that it is good when you have, like, when you are, like, doing a poem and you have, like, a lot of clout. And then you are able to then say, hey, your poem was good. Because when I was a young poet when I was just starting out. It was having poets with way more clout compliment my shit that made me stay on it. And so, yeah, I would, like, I would never, like, look down on, like, people who do that. I say, like, thank you for for doing your community service. Um, give me another number, please. Uh, 24. 24, we are going for... Is there a slam poet? What do you mean by is there a slam poet? As in, like, is there a... Is there a slam poet? Interpret that however you choose to. I believe that there are poets who, like... I mean, I haven't met them personally, or at least maybe, maybe I have, but I haven't noticed. But, like, there are perhaps some poets who, like, mainly specialize in slam poetry and mainly do it competitively, I don't necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily about that life, because as much as I appreciate slams for what they are and their presence, because I think that having a level of like healthy competition, it gives a space for the competitive people to like push themselves, and I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. However, I do find the way that slams are done is that it kind of becomes a bit of a trauma Olympics. Yes. And as much as I, it's weird. It's like, how do I say this in the nicest way? Either yeah, it's- You don't have to be nice. Fantastic. <laughs> Either it's an Olympics of like how much trauma you've been through 
or you're trying to basically dazzle people with your wordplay but 90 percent of the time like people's idea of dazzling with wordplay it just sounds like an early childish gambino song it's not necessarily like, a bad I, thing. Like, I love I Gambino, love... but also Gambino grew and figured himself out. And that, yeah. like, it's one of the things where like, I, I'm i always pro-slams. I love the general idea and ethos behind the slam. I think one of the things I love about a slam most is, especially how they are advertised, looking at the makeup of the audience, etc., they are one of the events on the scene that has the most regular people in the audience. Mm. As much as I love open mic nights, for as much as I love all these other nights, open mic nights especially, poets in the audience, you're to other poets. Mm -hmm. Slams, there is a lot of that audience that are just not poets. They're fans of poetry, but they're not poets. So I loved that communication and seeing my poems work on the general public, I loved that. But it is also at some level of because it's a general public and because it is a competition level of like, well, my mum's death was worse than your mum's death, so therefore <laughs> I get a bigger applause than Literally you. Or my depression is worse than your depression. My coming out story sucked more than your coming out story. Yeah. So take that and and it's it's a really weird thing to navigate, especially and like I don't know if I'm gonna say this just because I'm a little bitter and because of like, I, I fucked, I fucked this up myself. I shot myself in the own foot, but like the last slam I did because I, for my like final, final piece, I gave the audience a choice. One of the judges didn't like the fact that I gave the audience a choice <laughs> and then basically took off like two, like not Ooh. two point marks, two point marks <laughs> not two decimal marks two like big boy marks and i was like shit and like it was such a huge thing that it made me like because i got in second place i knew that like if he had actually like not fucked me over i would have won and i am mad as hell about that but also at the same time it was a really good lesson to just be like hey sometimes you just gotta like just say what you want just say them just say the best thing you can but it's like, the reason I gave people the choice is because I was having fun. And yeah. I was like, hey, let's have fun. Like, Wait, it's, that, it's that mix of like, it's that thing of like, in a competitive space, there's a weird thing of, I'm not taking this seriously. Yeah. Almost. Which some which I personally appreciate, but some people weirdly are and kind of like, yeah. but this is a condition. And like, you, like, I know you said it, the point is not the point, the point is the poetry, but also bitches just haven't no you can't be having fun here you've got to be performing your fucking literally and it's and i'm and like it was such a weird uh situation when that happened because like i, I lost to a white girl who was doing a who won by doing a poem about how racism is bad yeah <laughs> uh, like and uh it's, it's like, i <laughs> I don't judge many slams. I should not be allowed to judge many slams. I know I did end up judging the Hammer and Tongue Brighton slam as of time of recording last month. At, no, this month. I know how time works. It was this week, wasn't it? Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the last time they did the slam, I was judging it. And I'm very aware in Tyrone's personal bias of how we're doing it. These two fuckers did not use the mic. I'm going to dock them some points because they didn't use the mic. Yeah. It, like, 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 I will give points for accessibility there and level of like, cool, just because you think you can project, a mic will always be better at projecting than you think you yeah. are. Yeah. And I think that, like, I like the idea. That's the thing. I feel like not enough people recognize, or at least there needs to be more work to clearly state that slams are their own thing. Oh, yeah. And, like, obviously there's a lot of overlap in slams and open mics and that people go to both of them. And, like, especially it feels in London, there is that level of the poets competing in slams don't particularly care too much if they're in a slam or if they're an open mic. Yeah. They're just performing because, fuck it, I've only got one gig on this week. I want to do another gig on. So, like, in that yeah. sense, there's not a thing. Yeah. But in the way they are viewed by both the audience and promoters and all that side, yeah, they they, they come up differently. Yeah. And I I think also cuz like 
when I was working at Apples and Snakes, they normally had like this annual like slam for kids. But then this year, but then one particular year, they were like, no, we're, we're not even going to have it like a slam. We're just going to have everyone like appreciating one another's work. And one of the beautiful things that it led to because it wasn't competitive was that this one girl was um, doing a piece that was inspired by like, I, th- I can't remember what the song was. I think it might've been a Phoebe, Phoebe Bridges song, mm-hmm. but she forgot the words halfway through. And then another girl who was like in another one of the groups started helping her out with the lyrics. And then it eventually led to them basically duetting. Mm-hmm. And it was so fucking heartwarming, bro. Like, Oh my god! It was like Disney movie shit. No, for as much as I love the slams, it's the thing of like, no, there are poems you in the slam that you don't. Yeah, the poems you do an open mic that you don't do in a slam, and it's yeah. like I don't like that. But <laughs> also, no, it's the thing of like, no, but also if I if I'm, if I'm gonna try and win the crowd, so no, this is no better poem. This is the and like some of that just literally just level of this is the format of it. Like in a slam, if they're gonna hold up the scores straight after I said the poem, I need to do the poem that's a bit more obvious, et cetera. Yeah. Like I was talking to my friend Sienna about that the other day and literally level of like, not that this poem is better than the other poem, but in a night when you've only got three minutes and you have no time to do any context thing, prep or whatever, and you're just saying the poem, do the poem that's clear. Yeah, no, fully. Cause I, I, this was less of a slam more of a general competition, but I was doing Brighton's Got Talent a yeah. couple of weeks ago. And I knew that I had to do the poems that were like the most in your face and clear cut because I didn't have time for subtlety. I was I was competing against drag queens that were taller than me, that were prettier than me, that could light their tits on fire. I mean, and you could do that part. You see, the thing is, I might just light my tits on fire with a poem. I just need to write a poem that appropriately allows me to light my tits on fire. I have fire. now said it multiple times like for as much as I don't want to give performance too much on too much points for performance. If you backflip during any poem you're doing, no matter what the fucking poem is, you're getting a fucking ten out of ten. I do not give a shit. Like like midway through the poem, backflipping while saying the poem, you're getting a ten out of ten <laughs> from Tyrone, no matter what. Do a fucking Nigel Farage poem. No, no, no. do your OJ Simpson poem and backflip as you say he's innocent. You are getting a 10 out of 10 straight up. Oh God, this might have inspired my next poem. <laughs> Another number, please. Um, 99. 99. Um, describe yourself in three words. Um... Bisexual, kind-hearted douchebag. I mean, I feel like that's the title of one of your poems. Already, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'd say like um, bisexual because like I've definitely over the last uh, five years accepted that I am incredibly fruity. I am very sassy, and I love it. Mm-hmm. I I live for my like. I am so sassy that I remember my girlfriend was showing me like a a reddit am i the asshole where like the original poster was like am i the asshole for like saying that when my husband drinks wine it gives me the ick and i physically rolled my eyes (laughs) and scoffed and i was like wow that's that's just the person i am now um yeah i'd say uh heartwarming because like i am i'm very big on like people and community and i I, I get very scared that I am not, that I might be uh, not showing that I care as much to people. Um, but like the truth is like, I want to be able to hang out with everyone on a weekly basis, but I do not have Beyonce's hours. So I cannot, um, but like, yeah, I always am really big on just spending time with people because I know that that's like the main thing keeping me sane and douchebag is just because like i gotta remind myself that like because i will get a bit lost in my own sassiness that sometimes i just gonna be like hey 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 hey, you're being a bit of a douchebag sometimes like like you don't know every like i don't know everything i i don't have all the answers 
I am not the greatest entertainer to have ever lived. And yeah, it's sometimes like I often need to humble myself to just be like, okay, calm down now. And I'll end on one more. So give me one more number, please. Um, 14. 14. We are ending on what is the most you'd spend to watch poetry? 15 pounds. I don't think any poetry night, unless you're doing... I Okay. <laughs> if you're doing a poetry night, I guess the limit is about 15 pounds. And that's like if you're doing... And that's if you're putting on a damn fine night. Anything above 15 pounds is like, there's got to be some music. There's got to, like, you better have a DJ to, like, provide some tunes between the breaks. I don't even think there should be an open mic if it's, like, that expensive. Because I don't think anyone should pay that much just to perform. So I think, Paying like, for a variable quality thing is always a... Yeah. I find that fit weird. For sometimes. me, like, yeah, the 16 plus pound mark, that's, like, a poetry show... Where it's like all features and you're actually like paying for like a live, live performance. Um, Cause yeah, I, I hope they're not going to see this, but like um, one of my favorite examples is so far sounds where like you are paying like 25 pounds, 24, 25 pounds for a ticket. And there's no guarantee you'll even have like seating at a so far sounds gig, but there is a dead, but like, the caliber of musicians and the fact that they actually do try to make sure that all of the musicians there have like a decent sound. Mm -hmm. I feel like that balances things out. Wait, I mean, also with so far, there's some level of they are, such you are paying for the experience of it mm -hmm. and that little whole level of the, I think there's a lot of safety to so far because it's such an established yeah. name and brand where it's like, I don't want to say like you're not going to get ripped off because some people do feel a bit ripped off by mm. them. That not their opinions, not mine. <laughs> keep keep booking me so far. Like <laughs> it's great, it's lit. Um, but yeah, the but yeah, some people want would like more, which I understand and empathize with. But like I feel like once you get into the music band, I feel like that's when you can start charging more than fifteen pounds just because. For the sheer task of a musician carrying their equipment from home to the venue, it is a logistical nightmare. So giving them, so having a slightly more expensive ticket to balance that out, that's where my mindset is rather than, oh yeah, it's going straight into like the shareholders' pockets. So. Well, it's not that poets don't do the work and again, poets get paid, get all the money you need to get, etc. Yeah. Again, this is that weirdly, annoyingly logistical thing of, you put the work in to create the work you're doing and you need to be paid for the work you did beforehand and all of that stuff and the creative mind and all that side of things. But when you also then take into account, you're looking at musicians and whatnot that have had to pay for their gear, bring their gear, etc. So no, I have time for that. Like I would put weirdly, not weirdly, um, comedy and poetry had put on that same bracket because mm. you're both putting the same thing beforehand. Like, you're both putting the same amount of time, not the same amount. But the comedians need the extra money for the cocaine. No, <laughs> only the professional ones. Oh only yeah, the only the professional ones. ones. The, the fuck, the fucking open mic ones. They they can pay for their own cocaine at that stage. Like <laughs> you, 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 need, you need to get to the stage when like, oh now I'm a name now. Now you can buy cocaine for me. Like yeah, oh. I yeah I I think that is kind of how I see things. Of um, like the cost is there are so many things that go into the cost like. I I remember having to like raise the prices of Poetry Jam and it was just by like two quid and I was I was in shambles for weeks. I was just saying like, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. Like it's fucked up. But then it's like me and Kayla have been going back and forth over like the price for process. And some of that is we want to pay our features more. And then even the weird things of like, we should maybe pay ourselves for, for, for doing the hosting and doing the work etc it's very easy to reason with yourself that it's okay to run an event for free yeah until you realize just how much work it actually is and, and like going for early uh, in the podcast despite the fact that we're saying oh no we can run it in our sleep it's fine kind of vibes it's also level that we are still 
having to be there every single month and be the host and still be active and much as it runs itself yeah i think because we had to get there in the first place i think also yeah it's like the it's the question of the stability that the 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 money offers you where like if you're doing it for free the instability that comes with it you're just having to deal with so much shit that because of that you're not able to actually deliver a good experience because yeah it's i mean it's why we have fucking labor unions it's like you want if you want to do a good job you need to be adequately remunerated for it and i think that that's oh, remunerated i think that that's necessary and i'm a big advocate for that i just think that um and i think that like a lot of audiences nowadays do support that a lot more um but it also depends on like the price range of your of your event like if you stay under 10 pounds then i think it should be fine once you're beyond 10 pounds it's like you need something which is why like Grooveverse, for instance, because it has like a whole live band behind mm. them, I'm like, the price absolutely makes sense. It's my whole thing of like, you know, if you're, again, you're putting on an event, you're putting on a show that whilst, yes, you're probably going to mainly expect poets to come to, anyone in the general public can come to it and wants to get a good night out. If you're going to be put, making them get a good night out, put on a good show. Exactly. Like, for people that aren't the best hosts, it's like, like, this is why you would get someone else to host for you. Like you're putting on a good evening where people need to have some fun during the evening. And I say fun in the loosest possible way and as much as entertain them. Yeah. Whether, and you can do entertaining, obviously, as we've discussed, with some serious topics mm -hmm. in there as well, but a level of you're putting on a night yeah. that's these people are giving up their free time in a cozy lives crisis, whatever you want to yeah. fucking call it. You give them a good night. Exactly. Make sure it's entertaining in some way, shape, or form. Exactly. Thank you for all the questions, all the talking, all the things the there. The all mine. Um, as I like to do for these endings and whatnot, you have a camera, you've spoken to it already. Speak to it again, and if you want to be found online, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me um, at Kid and Nancy, K I D A N A N S I, mainly on Instagram because that's where I mainly like sh uh, put my shows on. But I also do have a website which is just kidandnancy.com. So please do like visit my website uh, for all my upcoming shows because I am trying to make more of an effort of like putting that up on my website so that people can just access it easily. And other stuff. Obviously, you've got Riverside Rhymes. You've got Goddamn Poetry Jam. You've got X Second London. How regular are they? Because people hopefully can listen to this more than just the one time or more than just when it releases. So when can they find those events? Where can they find those events? So uh, poetry that Goddamn Poetry Jam is on the third Tuesday of every month at the Fiddler's Elbow in Camden. Riverside Rhymes is on the last Wednesday of every month at uh, Riverside Studios in Hammersmith. And Extra Second London is on the last Saturday of every month at um, uh, at St. Margaret's House Chapel in Bethnal Green. Word of mouth, um, I believe, I think we're changing venues. Uh, so depending on like where the new venue is, we'll let you know. But like, yeah some cool stuff will be happening very shortly perfect i think that wraps up your side my side as is always the thing we're on all the socials we're on all the things there is a link tree in the links here and in the bio and in the somewhere you can google process productions and find all our shit i have been tyrone this has been kid and Nancy. together we have made a podcast somehow in some way shape or form um and to quote the most famous Irish man to me. We love you. Now fuck off. Goodbye. Cool. Smoothly done. <laughs>